All right. Uh, welcome to Parallax. I'm your host, Tom Mark. Uh, with me today are Daniel Schmachtenberger and Alexander Barth. Daniel Schmachtenberger is a social philosopher and founding member of the Consilience Project aimed at providing public sense-making and improving public sense-making and dialogue. Alexander Barth is, amongst many other things, a philosopher, author, and futurologist. <clears throat> I'm very happy to bring you both together for the first time. So welcome both of you. Um, the goal you, and the idea of this conversation is in short to kind of generate a snapshot of where we are 2022, ideologically, politically, economically, and technologically, and where we are headed to the end of the decade. So where are we now in this time between worlds? And what are the possible and probable outcomes of our current trajectories? We are facing a crisis, while at the same time, our institutions do not seem to fit or able to solve these problems. It appears that the climate crisis is unfolding right now, and the war is brewing. The cultural divide in the Western Hemisphere, the culture war, is getting more intense. And at the same time, our myths and narratives don't work anymore. The postmodern policies of deconstructions have, for better or worse, negated our way of reducing complexity. <clears throat> so where are we now? Is the West going to fall, as Oswald Sprengler <clears throat> once put it? Is the chaos going to increase till we find a new way of life? Or is it, as it ever was, men struggling to find meaning in a complex world? Can digital provide us with the means to reconstruct the myth and narrative? And maybe more on the point, uh, at what point does it become wiser to acknowledge that it's too late to stop anything and turn our efforts to surviving it? So Daniel, if, <clears throat> if you had to start to paint this broad painting where we are right now, when, where are we now when you were to take up a systemic um, bird's eye view of things? I try to <clears throat> paint a brief, hopefully useful starting place picture. You were saying, you know, we're in a global crisis and you gave a few examples. Um, I often use the term meta crisis um, that is not just looking at the fact that we have uh, climate change and biodiversity loss and extinction of species and dead zones and oceans and topsoil loss and all those environmental issues, <clears throat> or that we have increasing fragility in supply chains or the problem of exponential growth on the uh, financial system and linear materials economy hitting fragility on planetary boundaries, or the AI risk, bio risk, cyber risk issues that new exponential technologies create, like all of these are possibly catastrophic risks. And we're in this interesting situation where the total number of catastrophic risks is increasing and the probability of them is increasing. And so rather than just see each of those as different separate ones, there are certain underlying drivers that we can look at that they have in common. <clears throat> talk about the generator functions of catastrophic risk. And um, so we would say that we are at a unique point in history, something where Alexander and I definitely agree is that uh, it's not just processes of the same thing always under the sun, being able to extinct species at scale and genetically engineer new species and synthetic biology is a different thing <laughs> than was true 2000 or 20,000 years ago. Um, and so the first truly existential tech we had in terms of technology enough that we could make choices that uh, damaged the habitability of the world was the nuclear bomb. And that was so recent in historical time. We built an entire world system to prevent using tech, that tech. And we had never done that before. Every tech we had, we always made an arms race to use as fast as we could. Now we built a whole world system that involved mutually assured destruction and the Bretton Woods monetary system and the UN IGO systems to ensure not doing that. <clears throat> While that succeeded in a way, it also drove all the catastrophic risks we're facing now into more likelihood. Like <clears throat> let's have a monetary system that increases exponential uh, GDP so everybody can have more without taking each other's stuff on linear supply chains that externalize cost to the environment, pushing all the planetary boundary issues. And you can make mutually assured destruction on two superpowers with one catastrophe weapon, but you can't on lots and lots of non-state actors all having access to different kinds of catastrophe weapons. So how do you deal with that? So we're in a situation where the post-World War II world is over. There's a lot more catastrophic risks and those types of solutions don't work and we need new ones. <clears throat> and what we'd say is that there's, so like whether we're talking about the risk from a particular kind of 
AI or bio or nuclear or climate change refugees leading to nuclear, whatever it is, there's the increasing catastrophe attractor, right? There's like an attractive basin defined by we can't manage our power well, coordination failures create increasing catastrophes. There's a thousand scenarios, but they're all kind of the catastrophe attractor. <clears throat> then there's this other attractor that says, in order to manage those, we must be able to monitor and control adequately. And that looks like pretty powerful centralized control mechanisms, which mostly turn pretty dystopic. So we can make sure that nobody builds <clears throat> Uh, catastrophe weapons in their basement using tabletop CRISPR if we have ubiquitous surveillance and extremely powerful control mechanisms, then that becomes pretty dystopic. So there's like catastrophes and dystopias as these two different attractors and exponential tech makes both more likely. You can run much more powerful top-down systems using AI and IoT. <laughs> you can also create a lot worse catastrophic dynamics with exponential tech. So we want a third attractor that is neither dystopic nor catastrophic. And that means that it has to have the capacity to check all of the power that could cause catastrophe on purpose or accident, but where that system that checks it must also have checks and balances and be oriented in a uh, life that is somehow desirable. And so <clears throat> how do we make, make it through the metacrisis, means make it through the catastrophes and the dystopias uh, to some kind of third attractor? What are the criteria of that attractor? Um, that would be a fine starting point of kind of where I see that we're at in the arc of history. And um, <clears throat> it, that, that quote in the book of Romans, something like the path to hell is uh, wide and many, the path to heaven is narrow and steep. It's easy to come up with dystopian sci-fi because humans have been pretty nasty stewards of power historically. And the idea of us having decentralized exponential power, like there's just a lot of bad scenarios. The idea of exponential power, <clears throat> AI and genetic engineering and whatever, going well with people like us running it requires some pretty significantly new thought. And so how do we come up with a positive future narrative that is not a naive, silly one? <clears throat> um, I think this is the topic it'd be fun to have us explore today. That, that's my kind of initial frame. <laughs> I can then add to that that uh, the, the reason why I got really interested in Daniel's brain a few years ago was that I was very alone being a philosopher of technology for quite a long time. And it was really required. Obviously, we live in the middle of a technological revolution. Here was a guy who was even more a philosopher of technology than I was, which is great. So we, it, it's kind of shocking that this is actually probably the first recording of a conversation between us because we've been friends for many years now and I highly respect Daniel's work. And I'm very excited about this conversation. So I just want to say that first. What I add to this is that um, I'm a narratologist. So here's a new word, right? Uh, please recall that the 20th century was, was mostly uh, used for deconstruction. You know, after the atomic bomb, August the 6th, 1945, the most important date in recent history for all of us on the planet. Like, I, I, I agree completely here with Daniel. Let, let's use that date. There's a certain date there, August 6th, 1945. It helps us to, to locate ourselves historically. And after that date, uh, deconstruction became the natural norm. It's just like we have to deconstruct all of history. We've only begun that process. We have to deconstruct Western history of the world right now that's happening. We have people all over the world who realize that the, there's a myth about Asia that is completely incorrect. There's a myth about Africa that's completely incorrect. And also America is finally shifting. America is not, it's not European any longer. America is now the meeting place of the world populated from pe by people from all over the world. And American English is the new standard language of the world that we all use to, to communicate. So even America is shifting in the sense that America is becoming truly a global meeting place today. And that's what's really interesting here. So I do narratology. And narratology is more than deconstruction. It's also reconstruction. It's basically the philosophical, uh, the philosophical search for the narratives that human beings tell about themselves. We, we are storytelling animals. We're storytelling flock animals. So we tell stories about ourselves all the time. And fundamentally, these, these stories have to be split into three different types of stories. So let, let, let me follow you into this one. The first one is precisely the one where Daniel is an expert. It's what we call the logos. This is how reality actually operates and how we symbolically try to understand how the world operates. For example, mathematics, you know, when language tries to be exact, that's when we go into the logos. The second one is pathos. You know, every time somebody tells you, do it once more with feeling. 
It's like add the pathos, please. You're a human being, right? You're not a machine. You do, you do it, you, you need to add the pathos to what you do. So pathos is, is, is the storytelling that's usually banned, banned from children's use. Just like I said, that pornography, violence, all of that is located in the pathos. And the third one is the mythos. And the mythos is the only way for the other two to be combined. So our, our predicament, as both Hegel and Nietzsche pointed out in the 19th century, is that the only way for us to have some kind of a narrative that we can share is to create a mythos. Not myth, but a mythos here. So these are the three basic stories, and they are dialectically intertwined. You cannot focus on one of them rather than the other one. And then if you look at power and domination, it goes to say that power and domination goes into these three realms. So the logos is the symbolic order. Uh, and the symbolic, it's more on the masculine side of things, if we allow us to say that, but it, it's more on the masculine side of things. And the logos, how the world actually operates, zeros and ones today, more than anything is the logos. And, and then that is, logos is presented as knowledge, the power through knowledge. Whoever has access to knowledge today would say data and data processing. Whoever has control over the knowledge or say dominates in the knowledge field has enormous power and influence. And, and that's, of course, we need to start today. The other one is violence itself. Who has the monopoly of violence over a specific territory? That's statehood and things like that. And that, that is the pathos. So that's the second realm. And the pathos will be called the real order. The real order of things is ultimately the, the physical world out there that we, if you walk straight into a wall and hit your head, you, you, just, you just encounter the pathical world out there. We can fantasize all we like, and we human beings fantasize individually, collectively all the time. But at the end of the day, our fantasies will be crushed and they will be crushed by what's called the pathos. So that's the second realm, the real world. The third one, the only one that can unite the other two is the imaginary order. The imaginary order is tied to the mythos. So we imagine the world. And this is where it gets important. We have to have an imaginary that makes sense to us. We have to have a shared imaginary if we're gonna share a society. And that's where the crisis is at. So what's happening right now, I would propose is that this is a paradigm shift in the sense that we're moving into the online world and the internet is taking over the world and we're globalized because the internet itself goes towards globalization, whereas we human beings are very local in our attitude towards the world. So the, 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 this was, this was, that's a paradigm shift. Now, why there's a meta crisis tied to the paradigm shift is that all these three narratives are in crisis at the same time. Daniel is the perfect guy in the world right now to list the reason why Logos is in crisis. That's exactly what he's talking about. After 1945, we've discovered that we're exploiting the world towards our own extinction. And that's, that's not a small thing to say, but that's exactly what we're doing. We could blow ourselves up with the bomb. We could also blow ourselves up in many other ways to just take more time. That's what the logos crisis is at. The problem is the other two aspects are in crisis too. The pathos, the pathos is in crisis. The mythos is in crisis. The mythos is in crisis in a very particular way. It's a, it's a crisis in, in the religious or the spiritual and therefore also political manner. Death has become the absolute. We now have an elite in the world today who believe they really will die when they die. That has never happened before in history. We have always excused ourselves with an afterlife or at least with a reincarnation. Reincarnation of the East, of the afterlife of the West. We have always had those myths before. Now we can no longer have a myth and therefore, we cannot have a myth that is utopian or dystopian either. We have to accept that we die and we die. And the only thing that can transcend us is children who inherit the earth after we're gone. We're into that mode now. We have now an elite in the world that have come to accept that. And they're dealing with it massively. And it's not a small thing at all when it's dealt with collectively. This is like Nietzsche's The Last Man. That's where we're located right now. So there's a crisis in, in the mythos too. There's a crisis in storytelling. We can deconstruct as much as we like, but if we don't reconstruct something valuable to us and have a new story, we're done. And the third one is the crisis in the pathos. This is the crisis of violence. This is the crisis of sexuality. But this is also the crisis mm. of nature itself that's now catching up with us. This is the crisis of the bomb. It's literally physical. This is the crisis of the climate. It's literally physical. Therefore, there's a crisis in the pathos too. So all the three different narratives are in crisis. All the three different narratives simultaneously have to be retold as a new shared narratology that makes sense to us. That's why there's a meta crisis. Can I ask you to um, just clarify a bit for what has to happen 
in Logos, in Pathos, and Mythos? Like, is there something like what you would think of as necessary and sufficient criteria of the new Logos, the new Mythos, and the new Pathos that converges towards a third attractor? Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, the third attractor we call Protopianism, and uh, I think it was Kelly over at Wired who invented the term, or maybe it's been around because it sounds a bit generic, but uh, Protopianism when I came to East Asia, and you travel there too, Daniel, a lot, like when I talk to the Japanese, the Korean, and the Chinese, it doesn't make sense to say anything today that they don't get or they don't subscribe to. And it certainly makes a lot of sense to listen to them and their history, right? Because uh, we share a world with them now. Uh, protopianism makes sense to anybody in East Asia. The utopian dystopian dichotomy was always Western. And we got it from Abrahamic religion. It doesn't make sense in India. It doesn't make sense in China or Japan. But the protopian perspective, which is the incremental improvement and work towards optimization of processes, makes sense. That makes sense globally. So I would start with saying that all these different narratives now have to be protopian. We need to get rid of the utopian, the drive towards the utopian, and the dystopian, which is what you call the third attractor, which I think is brilliant. The third attractor is now required because it's the only credible global narrative we can have. And it goes for both the logos and the mythos and the pathos. They all have to be protopian. And you and I, in one of our little night sessions over in California, came up with a term that I love called symbiotic intelligence. So I think we should, we should AI is what the machines will do, but as long as we human beings are involved in a collaboration with the machines, I think it makes more sense to speak of an SI. An SI is an AI ultimately controlled by humans serving our interests. But that takes a lot of maturity from us as well to work with the symbiotic intelligence. But the symbiotic intelligence is an intelligence that works towards optimization or process at all times. And of course, this is not an optimization or process that's ultimately exploitative. That's what we use the term imploitation in our work all the time. You know, and we talk about resilience, sustainability of these things. The employative aspect has to be implemented within a protopian process, meaning that you have to give back what you just used. In that sense, you cannot exploit the world any longer because it's the end of the story. So employative means closed loop or real Exactly. Cost? Employative is opposite to exploitative. So it's easy to understand. It, it's the opposite of that. We use the word for the past 20 years. And what's important here is that protopian ideals, meaning that if you're an artist, you go protopian. If you're an engineer, you go protopian. If you start a company, you should have a protopian company from day one. So the way to make incremental improvements on the world through your work, which is how you do technology, essentially. That once we've created the technology, it's there. And technology in itself is a pharmacon. It can be it can be good or bad. It can be Hiroshima. It can also be fusion nuclear. A pharmacon. A pharmacon means that a technology in itself is neutral. It, it depends on what we human beings do with it. And in this sense, of course, atomic power is the perfect example of a pharmacon. So that's what technology Actually, technology itself should be neutral to us. And then we ask ourselves the question: how do you use that technology to the benefit of mankind long term? It was actually a, a funny point of intersection, and um, I wish that my schedule over the last week had been different, and I got to read more of your uh, recent work and share some things with you. Um, we actually just published a paper with Consilience Project called Tech is Not Values Neutral, um, like a few days ago, so it's just funny to come to this point. It's, um, it's maybe an interesting topic for us to discuss, because it doesn't map to the logos, pathos, mythos perfectly, but... The, um, the infrastructure, social structure, superstructure way of looking at uh, the, the domains of civilization and the fact that uh, psyches and cultures are directly affected by tech. Uh, and it's not just what values we bring to it determines if it has a good or bad use. It's that every technology is an extension of human choice making. It catches on because it confers power. And thus, whoever uses it and gets more power usually ends up driving the beginning of a new arms race of some type that obligates other people to use it. That codes a pattern of human behavior to use the tech as opposed to not. Coding that pattern of human behavior affects human psyches, value systems, belief systems, everything. And then the distribution of that affects um, cultures and societies. So we call this uh, psychosocial externalities rather than physical externalities. And so physical externalities, we know the, <clears throat> the pollution and the harm in the supply chain and whatever that occurs. So we have to go physically closed loop, meaning we're not using unrenewable physical resources or turning them into trash or pollution. We have to go psychosocial closed loop too. Um, uh, 
and it's not going to be closed loop in the same way, but it does mean forecast the psychosocial effects and internalize them into the design process. Um, because obviously <clears throat> uh, something like the nature of the algorithm that optimizes for engagement, which in, optimizes for outrage, which ends up polarizing a society or shortening attention spans. Like these are very real effects on psyches and society. So it's not fair to say tech is values neutral. Tech was built to advance certain values like um, ease and um, brevity and comfort and whatever. It advances those, it affects other values and it does so at scale. And so if you don't actually think about what are the values that are worth valuing and how do we build tech that enhances those, then because the tech is so powerful, it will end up damaging them. And so you actually can't think about the evolution of culture independently from the tech plex that ends up determining what wins behaviorally. I agree. So the point here is that engineers have no clue what they're doing historically. So like if, if, you, if you would have asked Gutenberg about the printing press in 1415, it was quite an event when the printing press arrived. I mean, they started printing Bibles quite quickly to start with. And that was his point. The point was that you should translate the Bible to local dialects around Europe so that Europeans could read the Bible and become all the good Catholics that he wanted them to be. Actually, he created the end of the Catholic Church. It's been, it's been growing gradually, but you know the whole question of the Catholic Church and now it's just basically diminishing into nothing started with Gutenberg. He was the killer of the Catholic Church. He just didn't know. So the problem is that engineers are usually, historically speaking, very unaware. So I just want to remove the sort of the guilt applied to them afterwards. Like, you don't even know what people do with you. I mean, Nietzsche couldn't know that Hitler would come along and Marx couldn't know that Stalin would come along. You can't blame people afterwards what people later are doing in the sense that we usually do. So my point is this, though, that there's a social responsibility for creating an environment where technology is created in the first place. The one thing we have learned is that we hardly change at all. Human beings are basically the same we were, say, five or 10,000 years ago in the very short span that we created civilization. What we do create is technology. The way I frame it is that I said, women give birth to children. Men envy women for giving birth to children. Men, therefore, give birth to technology. The problem is that if technology develops quicker than children do, which it tends to do, it's only a question of time before technology kills the child unless you intervene, right? So the, the, that's essentially the history of civilization in five sentences uh, in a very Freudian sense. So my, my point in calling technology value neutral is of course, nothing is value neutral in, in the formal sense, but it is to point out that technologies are pharmaconic, usually by, by, by historical necessity, and then we can look at them. Today, we know more. And today the loops of technological innovation are so tight and involve so many people that the pathos of the mythos are obviously now involved in the loop of the logos itself. We are really beginning to look at the word dialectically. We're really beginning to look at the world. These three narratives are now colliding one another. We cannot trust any one of them because as human beings, we have to operate all three and we have to reform all three at the same time, which is exactly why this is a meta crisis to solve. Yeah, we have to <clears throat> do all three at the same time. You and I totally agree on. We're not looking at a theory of change. We're looking at an ecosystem of theories of change, an ecosystem of projects that have a protopic direction to them, have a third attractor, attractive basin to them. <clears throat> and the desire for what is like the comprehensive solution set or roadmap for humanity is, a, is based on the fallacy that a centralizing intelligence could do that thing. Um, so I think we think very much the same way about that. Uh, it's interesting. I want to try to tie a couple things together that you said. You were mentioning that uh, Marx can't really be blamed for Stalin and et cetera, because people can't really forecast what's going to happen afterwards. Einstein and the bomb, great example. Um, I think it's true that uh, I was talking with a friend the other day about um, all of the like hopeful projects that were going to make the world better that didn't happen that he was kind of traumatized by um, and where their hope and how good they would be uh, was false. And I said, yeah, but you also need to equally factor all of the um, devastatingly bad things that people forecasted during that time that didn't happen as well, that the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't become World War III and Y2K didn't in the world and 2012 didn't and on and on. And that if you factor them both, people just suck at forecasting the future because it makes sense that we would. We can't get the weather right 10 days out like 
multiply embedded complex systems or hardware. We're just not going to do that. So we have to get recursive intelligence processes that can do a little bit and increase the collective intelligence that can keep doing that. That said, I think there are some things we can do to forecast externalities much, much, much better than we ever have that are kind of low hanging and is really worthwhile. And so one thing, as you're mentioning, that the engineers, I mean, I think the engineers have been profoundly competent in the domain that they were trained, but as soon as you understand that technology codes patterns of behavior that end up coding minds that then in mass code societies, of course, technologists have to be trained in social sciences. Um, and axiological design, what are the value sets that will emerge from the use of these technologies has to be a consideration. Doesn't mean you'll get it all right, but we need to work at it and then recursively work at it and improve the process as we go. So I think when you have bigger frameworks like that are superstructure, right? Our collective definition of the good life and values, and whatever, our social structure, our economics, governance law, agreement fields, and our infrastructure, our techplex, co-influence each other so that you don't try to do sense making within one, you do sense making across them. Just basic shit like that really helps, right? It really helps the forecasting. But one other thing I wanted to say is there's a very interesting thing right now where the argument that we can't possibly forecast the future well enough ends up being a source of plausible deniability for people not even trying where it's in their vested interest not to. And the less wrong community had the, this blog post on, uh, is it mistake theory or conflict theory? That's a bigger deal. Meaning the mistake theory are the problems, the result of shit we just couldn't have possibly known and the externalities are too complex. Or is it conflict theory, meaning we actually wanted to cause that problem or we wanted the benefit and we didn't really care if we caused that problem. And of course it's some of both. Um, but some of the argument in there is uh, Michael Vassar and others commented is uh, that the existence of the possibility of mistake theory serves as a plausible deniability cover for a bunch of conflict theory to hide itself and say, oh, we couldn't have possibly known. Oh, bullshit. You didn't try because it wasn't in your interest. Yeah, I, I, actually... I, I, I'm just thinking of like Instagram. It, wouldn't they have known that they would cause like a massive psychiatric health care crisis among teenage girls? Well, we it was quite obvious. If, you and I pointed that out from the very beginning. Like, just like they, they could have known, but they didn't want to hear it, right? Because they wanted to. Aaron Lanier was telling everybody at the time Facebook was starting and whatever, it's going to do these things. And they're like, shut up, hippie. And um, no, it's not. There's no possible way. But of course, the motivated reasoning is a, is a problem, right? Motivated reasoning is tricky. So here's the piece that I wanted to add, which is there's a very perverse piece of kind of game theoretic incentive here that has to be bound, which is that it is very disadvantageous in a market type dynamic for any individual or group to focus on what the possible risks might be. And it's very, ad of the thing that they would develop. And it's very advantageous to just focus on the opportunities and benefits. Because if I do protracted risk assessment, somebody else hits first mover advantage faster. And if my protracted risk assessment says, actually, the field is too dangerous, we shouldn't do it, it's not going to stop the fucking thing. The market is going to move. The people who move fastest will privatize the benefits and then socialize the losses. And so there's a focus to move fast, break things, socialize the losses. Nobody takes responsibility. That perverse game theory keeps people from even trying to think well. And when the worst harm you could do was add lead to gasoline, which was pretty fucking bad, right? It, it decreased the IQ of the planet by like a billion points and made people four times more violent. It's like, Jesus Christ, that's a huge deal. When you say humans have been about the same for 5,000 years, I'm like, no, man, fucking just let it gasoline alone made us a billion IQ points stupider and four times more violent. Like that's a big deal. And that was one of 50 million chemicals in the, in the chemical database that we've made. But, but when it, comes to synthetic biology and general artificial intelligence, by the time we're dealing with those types of externalities, it is, it's totalizing. And so we actually have to do some fundamentally different types of coordination around how to think through the long term better using models like attractive basins and things where you don't have to get every detail of complex systems right, but you can get general principles and where you disincentivize move fast and break things. And this is actually things like to open up a new category of tech, you actually have to open up the, you have to get regulatory approval to open it up as opposed to regulate after the harms have already happened. Um, that's of course that bothers everyone because they don't trust states to regulate. So we have to also restructure the state from scratch because the power to check the catastrophes creates dystopias unless you also have strong bindings on it, but you have to face these things together. Yeah, and that's where it gets interesting here with the narratology. You just said the state here. 
the state is in the imaginary realm. It's not a logical realm, it's an imaginary realm. So, so we did inherit from religion and the gods and the forefathers and all that. We inherited this idea of the state and that would be the king or, you know, with the priest. And eventually that becomes the state we have today. And the state is so far behind. And the problem here is, of course, is, is the other one, is that if you, have, if you create a monopoly, it will instantly go corrupt and become dysfunctional. And we've created states so far that are not competing one another at all. They're local monopolies. And this is, of course, the problem. You've got the market. The market is incredibly efficient. I can give you an example. I, I, with my team, we just studied construction sites in East Africa. East Africa is like wide open right now. It wants to expand quickly. It looks at China and India. It doesn't care too much about regulation. So this is the perfect place for a Chinese construction company to bid the shit out of a French construction company with a bid for a construction in Nairobi. Because the French come there with a European attitude. They've learned, you know, the hard way that we need to make an assessment, a risk assessment before we start building. And by the time they start the risk assessment, the Chinese are already up and building the construction anyway, because they don't care about the risk assessment. So we still have this sort of this blatant, aggressive form of capital capitalism running around the world. And then on the other hand, we have exactly what you said, which is like, we need to create a functioning container within which the market can operate with some certain rules. And then people scream, oh, that's socialism and we need a bigger state and we know states don't function any longer. And the states are going incredibly corrupt, slow, and they no longer work. This is again, this is part of the imaginary order crisis. So it's in the imaginary order. It's a crisis of religion and politics in a fundamental one. Now, I like then to go back to what actually worked. And I know you also, you, you tend to quote the Silk Root Triad, you tend to quote Taoism, Buddhism, and Zoroastrianism. I do too. I find very, very little solace in Christianity and Islam when it comes to trying to understand where we're at right now. I prefer these religions that have been around for thousands of years and they've been created along the trade routes. So I go to the metaphor of the bazaar. Now, how does a bazaar work? Well, a bazaar has to be employative because it's going to be around for thousands of years. It's probably in some kind of an oasis town along the trade route. You put an old, smart, wise woman at the door. You know, you put that bitch at the door. Nobody gets in without her permission. So you have a membrane. And containers start with functioning membranes. So there are rules to how you conduct the trade in the bazaar. Otherwise, the bazaar will not work. It's not a free market. It's not a free for all. You can do whatever you like because then the bazaar falls apart. So if you think of the system we're looking at as a kind of a bazaar that we need to create for the digital age, it starts to make sense. Then we can have different bazaars that compete in one another, but we have to have a central framework for all the bazaars of the world which is how we employitively use the world in that sense so that we don't completely go into collapse. So th the problem here is that we both on a global level have to have a network of bazaars and then on the local level, there are the bazaars. But what I'm then proposing is that the bazaar looks to its own self-interest long time. See, it keeps itself alive as a container within which you can put the content. And this is why the market will not work unless the market is regulated. It has to start there. So the markets themselves have to look at their own regulation. Otherwise, we should just boycott the market, not be part of it. You just say that, I don't want to be in the bazaar at all unless it works. Unless, unless it has a functioning membrane, unless it takes responsibility for itself in relation to other bazaars, it's not a trading place for me to be involved with. It has to be something like that because we have a major a meta crisis of politics right now. Uh, we know the states that we construct are no longer working. The only alternative out that seems to work right now it, interesting enough, imitates Egyptian dictatorship, and it's called communist China. They at least seem to have a sense of what we call a sensocracy, where they're going and how they will control everything to a central computer. We also know that that won't work either. So the question is, how do we open a society that's free and open enough to stay creative and to stay open to bad news, which dictatorships never do, which is exactly why they go extinct eventually, and this is, of course, the central question, ideologically speaking. And it's, it's a question of imaginary narrative. It's in the imaginary order. That's the crisis there. The reason that you're saying it's fundamentally imaginary and why the bazaar worked and the market didn't is the bazaar had a long-term survival interest and the market doesn't, and that the, the long-term interest is in the imaginary realm. There was some narrative that everyone in the bazaar was a part of that was self-transcending, so they wouldn't... Uh, fuck the future to benefit themselves for some reason. And that that's what's missing currently. That's the mythos is what is it that has us <clears throat> not maximize short-term personal gain because there is some higher order transcendental narrative that we will have be a basis to bind our behavior. Is that right? 
Yeah. So if you're looking around the bazaar on a map, this is what you'll find interesting. Every bazaar, it had the hospice, it had the restaurant and the hotel, it had the bathhouse in, in a clip, which is also a social place. It had a gym. There was always a gym around the bazaar. They're called Sarkani. The, the Persians invented the gym 3,000 years ago, where you go and work out and make your body fit. And then it has the bazaar, and you need to probably go to the whorehouse, which is another word for nightclub, to socialize with people and see strangers and make friends with strangers. And there's no better place than a nightclub or even a whorehouse, if we're honest about it, to make friends with a stranger. they be absolutely naked in front of somebody, which you are at a whorehouse, and therefore you can make a trade the next day. So... The matriarch sitting at the front of the bazaar will make sure that she checks you've done all these things. Now, here's the most important thing, though. It was in my team in London that they discovered that every bazaar, after you leave the bazaar, you leave the town and go to the next town to trade, you have to go up to a kostag. The kostag is the origin of the monastery. You literally have, after you've done your trade at the bazaar, you need to go to spiritual center and fix your mind. This is where you go into what the Tao is called Tao, or what the Zoroastrians call the Asha of the world. You go into a relationship where you actually, you go back into the logos, you go back into reality as much as you possibly can, including yourself, and you readjust yourself your own thinking. Oh, you did a bad deal in the bazaar? Get rid of it. Get over it. Move on. Come back with a constructive mindset. And all these trade route religions are basically, they, they boil down the ethics to, in what way are you constructively participating in the world? In what way are you constructively representing your tribe when you're out here traveling, doing the trades? In what way are you constructively supporting the community that just embraced you and welcomed you so you could do your trade? In what way are you constructively moving on to the next community you're going to enter so you can go into that bazaar and make more trade? So the question here is that, why do we miss out on the cost talk? We, 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 we separated religion from the rest of society and made it a private thing, something you do on Sundays. You go to church and show off yourself. And of course, that eventually ended up with us being cynical about religion. Like, well, I only go to church on Sunday. It's only worth investment if it looks good so I can make more money on the Monday while exploiting the world. So the, the cost talk is fundamental to interactions, especially when it comes to larger populations than our own tribe. As soon as we move into a larger population, tribe, we need to start containing ourselves and our behavior in relationship to other people. The cost talk eventually leads to the monastery traditions of all of Eurasia, especially Buddhist and Zoroastrian and Taoist monasteries. And I think it really pays off for most people today to go and spend some time a year or two in a monastery and try to figure out what it means to meditate and contemplate every morning of your day to have a constructive mindset towards the world. It has, to, it has to be his personal spiritual journey involved here. And it was required at the bazaars. It was required. It was the first thing they would ask you the next time you'd come to. Oh, did you go to the Kostak after you did the training bazaar, the last stop you made? Otherwise, you're not welcome. Otherwise, you haven't done your work. This became such an industry. You even had to build Kostaks in mountains. You know, got, hey, hello, Tibetan Buddhism. You had to build in mountain where the monks themselves and the nuns themselves prepared themselves for all the heavy load that they had to go through with the traders and the cost talks in the trading towns. So it became like a spiritual industry, but that's fine. And we need one today as well. So uh, did the next bazaar require some kind of uh, ticket or proof that you'd been in the cost talk or they took your word for it? No, Absolutely. And again, th this, is, this is how you get your credibility. You get your credibility because you've done the trade many times. And yeah, we can trust this guy. The way we do grading today, this is a 5.0, okay? And he also represents a community that is underrepresented inside the bazaar, meaning it's got to sell us stuff we haven't seen it before. Oh, that's quite exotic and interesting. Let him go in, he will do fine. But if he doesn't do fine, if he's outcompeted by others, he needs to go to the cost talk more than ever the next day to not take that looser mentality with him into the next trade. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Um, I, I not heard that story told that way. Um, so there's a way that I think about that relative to the world today where it, uh, it seems like something has changed in scale in a way that across the threshold that changed in type where the same thing even in network wouldn't apply. I'd like to ask this question and get your thought on it. So <clears throat> you went to the market after talking about the state and then you said, okay, in the market, there was something like law. The woman at the front um, 
had some kind of wisdom to be able to assess who you are, some record of if you went to the cost hog or not, some, you know, some indicators about you. And then obviously she's probably connected to a network of people who are reporting on what people are doing inside. And there's probably something like police and whatever, right? So uh, if someone is stealing or doing false advertising or whatever it would be that would go against the um, written or unwritten law of the thing, then they get kicked out or something like that. So there's something like rules and there's something like enforcement, which is what defines the membrane. And so acting on the inside requires participation with the rule set. One of the things that makes that work without being tyrannical is the smallness of scale. Yes. And so unlike a massive police state, um, if the police in that thing started to get corrupt, enough of the people could overthrow the police and Um, There's no such thing as a person at a bazaar who can use personalized data, micro-targeted, split-tested advertising on me. Like they can just say, I got the best shit. And I can say, what about these guys over here? Their shoes are cheaper and I can go touch them by myself, right? So there's not a radical asymmetry between billion-dollar corporations and the purchaser. It's like a dude on one side of the table selling stuff and a dude on the other side buying stuff. There's not that much asymmetry between the police and the non-police. And so the symmetry is part of what makes something like caveat emptor, buyer beware, be reasonable, or what makes something like the Second Amendment. Hey, if we need to throw over the police, we can deal with it. A reasonable idea. When you start to get to much more radical, when you get to much more size, if you want to have something like rule of law across that whole size, a very big membrane, then you get pretty radical asymmetries of power. In a radical asymmetry of power, you don't even have things like the ability to check the corruption on it or even consent as a valid idea because of things like undue influence. What does consent mean if I don't have capacity to consent because the other agent is so much smarter than I am that they can manipulate me to do shit, which is like a cult dynamics. But a cult dynamic is nothing compared to AIs on social media or whatever else doing stochastic terrorism and population-centric warfare. So I don't even need a monopoly of violence anymore. I just need a monopoly of influence. And the monopoly of influence can make people commit the violence I want or whatever it is. So when you start dealing with those who control AIs and those who don't, when you start to deal with that level of um, asymmetry of information processing and capacity, voluntarism doesn't mean anything anymore. The ability to, uh, because you cannot voluntarily consent in or not consent when you can't check all the stuff. What does it mean for the people to be able to check the state if there's no way to process all the information because the state's using AI to process all the shit, right? Um, And how do the people deal with the, if there is a policing force at all, the levels of asymmetry of power? So if you say, okay, fuck nation states, we're just doing city states, let's keep them smaller. And let's always make sure that if anybody has an AI, there's a competing AI. So you at least have something of some metrical size that can compete with it. Well, now we get this issue that let's just even take nation states. We could go to city states, but let's take something less than global governance. Anything less than global governance, you still get global multipolar traps. Meaning a situation where if they're going to do the fucked up thing, then we have to race to do the fucked up thing or they beat us, right? They're going to develop nukes. We we have to develop nukes. They're going to develop AI weapons. We have to develop AI weapons. They're going to overfish the ocean. Well, how do we stop them from overfishing the ocean if they have nukes and they really need the fish for their population growth? So if we don't overfish the ocean, the fish are still going to go. So we might as well race to overfish the ocean. So those race to the bottom coordination failures are because you don't have a monopoly of violence to be able to enact rule of law, which is why you want a global government. But you don't want a global government because a monopoly of violence with no checks and balances become totally corrupt. Catastrophes, dystopias. So you want a global government that is not corrupt. Well, that requires some magic, right? Um, Or really good design. And I think that's where you and I are going to get. So what I see is that the principles that we're operating at the bazaar were scale dependent. And that as the scale gets larger, you get fundamental breakdowns in some of those things. When the scale gets large enough, for instance, that supply and demand have a radical asymmetry, because even though in aggregate, the total amount of demand, total amount of supply is the same flow of dollars, the supply is not coordinated, the demand is not coordinated and the supply is coordinated, right? I don't have a labor union of all Google users who work together and use AI to coordinate how they want to use Google, but Google is a centralized corporation that actually has long-term planning and an org chart and a Gantt chart, whatever. So it's really Google, half a trillion dollar organization, or whatever, using AIs against a single user or Facebook or Nike or whatever it is. And 
they can employ radical behavior mod techniques. So there's no longer authentic demand driving supply. There's supply manufacturing bullshit demand based on one marshmallow stuff rather than two marshmallow. And then say, oh, but the people want it after driving addiction. And so when you have those types of asymmetries, it's asymmetric warfare. You don't have like the same principles that apply when there's symmetry, like buyer beware, like Second Amendment, like what, they just don't hold in the same way. So you need a fundamentally different way of thinking. How do we deal when there are competing interests across types of asymmetries of power that are totally unprecedented? Absolutely. I agree totally here. And I think you're not working on the same thing. You're doing it on the technological level. I'm doing it on the narratological level. I'm writing a book. I think you can do the tech level without the narrative level. No, exactly. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. So the, 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 um, uh, the narratology I'm doing at the moment, uh, uh, the reason why I got into this thing with the bazaar is, of course, the, the whole, the entire history of Eurasia is being rewritten at the moment by Asian historians, many of them Asian Americans, like Chinese American, Indian American, Persian American historians. And I have discovered that the entire history of Asia is just a European 19th century fantasy. It's completely incorrect. It's just, just read the wrong way. So that's exactly why we see these patterns. And, and the reason what we're doing is because Asia's history is much older than Europe's. And that's the asset here. We need, we need deep history. We need long history to, sh- to look at what systems work and what stories worked over long periods of time and which stories failed. And here's the interesting thing. The, it is that we're looking at units like empire, which is older, by the way, than nation, and look at these systems. So what is an empire? What is a nation? What could it possibly be? In what way would technology subscribe to an empire? In what way can human beings subscribe to a certain empire? And it turns out the empires that work were very loose. Uh, they were full of dialectical conflicts and dichotomies everywhere. They were allowed. They were certainly encouraged. Uh, they didn't worry too much about a diversity of looks like we do today. They ver- worried much more about diversity of talents and a diversity of opinions because it strengthens the systems long term. So you want to have these sort of competitive environments. You want to have them within certain containers that work. And, and you discover when you do these formats that you don't need the police unless the size is big. That's exactly why scale here is incredibly important. We take to the tribal size somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 people quite naturally. And anything smaller than that, we're perfectly comfortable with. We don't need a police force to be loyal to and even live and die for a community of, say, 1,500 people. But once it gets bigger than that, that gets more problematic. And that's why you need these sort of social systems and eventually even states or at least city-states, nations, whatever, for those things to work. And they are required. The question is, on what level can people, uh, you know, align themselves? In what, on what level can they, for example, vote for a politician that they would know and they say hi to in the street? Well, that's only to a certain level, but that's absolutely minimum level you must work with because otherwise people don't trust people around them. They don't trust the leaders, their elders or whatever. Then you have to go all the way up to global. That's the challenge here. It's unavoidable. There has to be some kind of at least loose global you know, collaboration here and some certain global rules. We have to have a membrane for planet Earth itself. And at least after the atomic bomb in 1945, in the late 1950s, we got the first pictures of planet Earth from outer space. We tend to forget how young these pictures are. It's only like a little more than 50 years ago. We finally saw this beautiful green, blue planet where we live. And we saw this huge, cold, dark space out there that we cannot relate to. So at least we know we have the Gaia. We have, we have that narrative. It's there and it's unavoidable. I would even say that I challenge my students these days to say that the one thing AI will take care of probably is to conquer outer space and you will not be involved. And maybe that's a good place to start because the hubris we've suffered from should have some kind of a price we need to pay. So you remind the students that if we don't fix this planet, which is the only place we know we can actually live in the universe, then we're done. So the planet has to be fixed. It has to be fixed. It's unavoidable as a question. And, and this is the largest size I think we should allow ourselves to think, to forget about our space. But think of the satellites, at least, of space surrounding the planet, creating the internet. And what we then come to is, of course, the complexity has increased to a higher level than ever. We should therefore expect people to go absolutely bananas over the next 50 years. That's our book, Did It to Libido, by the way. It's a very dark book because the first thing that will happen now is that people will go absolutely bananas. They will go for all kinds of conspiracy theories. They will create the weirdest sects and cults I've ever seen. They will lose themselves completely in this environment. It will not be safe to be outside. Anybody can kill you for whatever reasons you don't know. You know, if anybody can order your murder, you don't know who's going to kill you. Uh, Shiza Abe was killed in Japan. 
because somebody started making homemade guns in Japan. So Japan has the same gun control problem now as America for that very reason. So it's becoming a very unsafe world very quickly. Now that's quite obvious. So the question then is we then have to move quicker towards the global order. It has to be very, very loose. It has to be very loose. Then the question, the next question is, what would a sensocracy be like? We need algorithms. Algorithms have a bad reputation today because they're so bad today, but they could be much, much, much better. They could much better reflect the world, how the world actually operates. I, I call it the free and open algorithm to give it a positive spin is to get rid of the sort of manipulated algorithms, corrupted algorithms, and conformist algorithms that we have today. We need to get rid of the manipulation, the conformation, and the corruption of current algorithms. We need proper algorithms because algorithms is the only help we have with increased complexity to try to understand the world better. And leadership has to be based on proper algorithms that give you a fair view of what the world looks like. Again, back to the logos. The conspiracy theorists, mm -hmm. they want to avoid the logos as much as they can. So they jump between the pathos and the mythos, which is incredibly dangerous to put a lot of people in that realm. We need to go back to the logos and the algorithms are there to help us do that. Can you um, explain for me what you mean by the good algorithms that we need for leadership to work? Okay, so if it's a new paradigm, uh, it will be chaotic at first. Now allow for chaos, let's say an anarchy to establish itself first, which is what the internet has been so far. The old institutions that used to be powerful, the old logos, the old pathos and the old mythos and the institutions built on those old narratives will try to defend themselves all they can, although they're done. I call this the, the, the Versailles versus Paris uh, dichotomy. This is like 1789 in Paris. So Versailles today is politics. Politics tries to manipulate the algorithms in political directions. So the algorithms are not free and open. They don't reflect you and don't reflect the kind of world you want to live in and need to live in. Then we got the corruption of money. They used to put the ads on the side when they presented the algorithms for you when you did your search. Now the ads are at the very top and the ads are increasing the infiltrating the algorithm itself. It becomes a corrupt algorithm because money is corrupting it and money should not be involved in the creation of the algorithm, at least for you personally, we try to search the internet. The third one is the conformation. And that means the old established institutions hate the fact the world is splitting up in so many different directions and it's becoming so chaotic. So the old institutions like academia, like mass media, you know, television stations, you know, the old institutions, they will all say that you must be more alike, you must be more conformed, and therefore conformity in itself as a value. Precisely, we need more people to, you know, to be more creative about solving these problems. We try to conform everybody into the same pattern. So th these are the three forces of the old institutions. The way Versailles would attack the streets of Paris in 1789 by telling the streets of Paris off, not realizing the people in the streets of Paris could read write and count, which nobody in the nobility of Versailles could any longer. Therefore, the streets of Paris finally came to the conclusion, let's go to Versailles and chop their heads off because the old institutions are useless to us these days because we can create the new institutions that could work. Of course, that led to a bloodbath, which you want to avoid. You want to have a slow, gradual decrease of the old institutions and want the new institutions to come into place. And the new institutions that come into place must represent the logos, the pathos, and the mythos. They must credibly do that. The different expertises. That's why you and I are very, very careful to not ever speak like in a sort of general sense. We speak as the specialists we are, even if we're considered to be generalists. So I, I'm a narratologist. I do storytelling. Uh, John Sedekvist and I have worked with this for the past 25 years. You know, he was a former scriptwriter. I was a former music producer. It makes sense that we become philosophers of narrative and narratology. And we now want to move the whole deconstruction revolution of the 20th century into a reconstruction revolution of the 21st century, which is fiendishly hard. We call it narrative. You call it culture in your work. Where is the digital culture? Digital is still a chaos. Digital has hardly even happened yet. We just know it's going to happen. And digital is going to remember absolutely everything the way it's been programmed, at least. It's going to remember absolutely everything that happens. So thankfully, we have a data revolution in parallel with increased complexity. And that data revolution should be the free and open algorithms that can help us to guide ourselves so we get a fair view of how the world actually operates. It's required. I mean, and that's how we're going to solve climate change. At the end of the day, you're not guessworking any longer. You're actually providing proper data. No, climate change is happening. Here is the data. The satellites provide the data. 
This is the actual temperature in 500 different places around the planet right now. This temperature should be in July. This temperature that actually is in July. So, you know, the data at the end of the day convinces people finally to give up the resistance and realize that climate change is really happening. And now it has to be worked on. And that sort of logical argument, the logos, once the logos comes into the picture, it becomes a lot easier to convince more people this is actually happening. You cannot escape this any longer. This must be done. Before that, we just did the guesswork, we just did the storytelling, we just had fairy tales. Suddenly, it's real. And this, when the real, when the logos, when the real from the pathos to the logos comes into the picture, when the undeniable facts are there, we have more hope of getting things done than we did right before. So I, I generally agree that important deconstruction happened, an important reconstruction of a different type, a different dimensionality is needed. When you identify rightly that all of the uh, narratives had embedded power plays in them, um, and you kind of deconstruct that, and you look at all of the motivated reasoning that was involved, <clears throat> in a way you actually heighten power to be the, the only game there is because there is no uh, unifying basis of uh, ability to form shared basis for choice making. And so the ability to have epistemologies of is science and epistemologies of ought, ethics that work together better, that are never adequate, but we're continuously improving, that identify their own perverse incentives and where the perverse incentives affect the nature of the motivated reasoning itself. <clears throat> gives you something like, whether you call it metamodern or whatever, some capacity for um, shared choice making that is not just uh, the game of power. So I, I would very much like to go there. I'd very much like to go into the relationship between what has to happen in culture or narrative or superstructure or like our shared values or shared meaning making to inform choice making and how that relates to tech. But I think because you said a lot in there, I think the place I'd like to start is when you said what happened between Paris and Versailles, we want to do a slow version now so it's not so bloody, and that the previous institutions are kind of holding on. There's this story that like books like The Sovereign Individual put forward that said uh, changes in tech change social structures. We know that changes in infotech specifically do, right? So Marvin, Marvin Harris said the first argument, McLuhan really went deep with the second argument, and that you get a printing press and it um, ends feudalism and ushers in democracy and ends Catholicism and ushers in, you know, Lutheranism and other things, because the nature of everybody can have a newspaper and everybody can have a textbook is really different. So you, it's a democratizing force, but it was tech affecting the social system. So then the idea that the next, we, we got modern democracies based out of that. Um, the idea that the next major change in the information technologies, the internet computation and then shared distributed computation. And so now we can share value online by moving bits around in uh, net space as opposed to just atoms around in physical space. And we can find networks of affinity that are stronger than just the networks of geography. So the nation state that was a geographically based thing to move atoms around will be progressively less useful than the net based move bits around thing. And so you'll get these new emergent systems that kind of debase the old ones. <clears throat> I think this is a good and partial insight. I think there's a heap wrong with it. And I want to hear your thoughts on one part of it, because one specific part, there's quite a lot. The fact that we can move bits around and have that correspond to value doesn't mean we don't also still have to move atoms around or that the virtual world doesn't completely depend upon the physical world. And if the virtual world, depending upon the physical world, is debasing the integrity of the foundational thing it depends upon, there's a problem in that thing. Um, so there's a bunch of things I have that are a problem with it, but one in particular, when you talk about how to have it be less bloody in the old institutions, there was bloody overthrow of feudalism, right? The American Revolutionary War is one of many. There was a thing where the symmetry of power was such that the uprising army could deal with another army sometimes, right? Within a standing army. Pitchforks could deal with swords sometimes. Um, I don't see how the focus of how the old nation state institutional thing falls works very well with those who hold the nukes. Because 
there is no other force that overthrows that thing unless you talk about AI that can capture it. That's fine. Um, outside of that, we can see the USSR go through a complete socioeconomic collapse, a collapse of the political economy and stay a world superpower and turn itself into something else because we got fucking nukes. So back off. Like it's a, so I'm curious how you think about that. When you think about the transition of power and uh, how hard it is to deal with that particular part of it. Well, the old structure stays. <clears throat> it doesn't go away. You know, food was still incredibly important. Even when capitalism arrived, it just the food production wasn't the center of the economy any longer. It became a marginal part of the economy. Um, so the same thing here. Uh, the nukes are a perfect case in point. So far, at least, they're not owned, owned by corporate corporations. Corporations don't have the nukes yet. Uh, so they, they're stuck with like large nation states, hopefully not too many of them too quickly, because otherwise the bomb is more of an acute problem than the climate all of a sudden. So th that's certainly an existential problem right there. And, and uh, I would say the, the institutions are still there. And what you want to do is you want to keep those institutions in the sense that, okay, a few of those institutions still have the problem with the nuclear bomb, so it's locked up for good, and then we can see if we use nuclear energy to something better. Um, in, in, Again, that means that let's not give Google the bomb. You know, the, 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 that's, that's the problem there. Whether that could still happen or not, we don't know yet. And there's, this is where it comes into, we know from Hegel that triads are stable and we need a triad. The problem with, with digital, the problem we call the netocracy, the pro problem with this new sort of, this sort of global power elite that rides on digital and happen to be the people with the right talents and the right motivation to be powerful and influential during digital is that it's an entire new paradigm altogether. And obviously big tech is the first one of the three metocracies. Uh, and, and it's the first one in the sense that the, the, the asset here is no longer land or capital, the asset here is data. And because uh, collecting and processing data is so fundamentally different from collecting and processing money, it requires a whole new set of talents. The money goes to those who have the data anyway, meaning they can concentrate on the data and the data processing. And that's exactly what big tech has done and then taught the rest of the world this is what we do. So that is just the first of three necessary uh, structures. And it represents the real in the sense that the data is the real here. But that requires also symbolic order and imaginary order to complement that. And we don't have those yet. Um, the Chinese have probably called you the way they call me. They're interested in guys like us at the moment, but they have their very definite plan of what they want to do next, which is to create what we call a sensocracy. And the Chinese idea of the sensocracy is that increased complexity, <clears throat> but also the possibility to use algorithms to con control data flows and have an oversight over the increased complexity requires, at least for China and China's history, to have one guy at the top. So they go, they don't go for the Persian model, which I strongly propose, which actually the US constitution is built on, which is that you install power sharing from day one into the system. Before the system kicks in, like in any bazaar, you, you, you make sure that the power is split between three, or which none can dominate the other two. Because if one dominates, the other two will stand up against the third. Therefore, you have a split. And this is the beauty of the US Constitution and what has kept the United States together since the 1700s, precisely the Constitution. The Constitution itself is an imperial order of Persian origin. And here's the difference. The reason why the Persians didn't spend their entire fortune building pyramids and finally just killing their whole civilization building pyramids was the Persians knew, Dutch and from Egypt, they didn't want that. They didn't want the pyramid constructions. They didn't want the entire culture being obsessed with feeding the dead, which is what the Egyptians did, right? They wanted to feed the living. So when Zoroaster constructed Zoroastrianism, one of the trade road religions, by the way, it's very close to Buddhism and Taoism. When he did that 1700 before Christ, he said, let's not do animal or human sacrifice any longer. It's just a waste of resources. He was in the logos completely. There are no gods who pay any attention to sacrificing humans or animals. This is ridiculous. Let's get over it. Let's die when we die. And let's transcend ourselves by having children who take over the world from us when we die. And therefore, he enabled the very thought that there could be civilization. This is the first time in human history somebody thinks what a civilization could possibly be. We could improve on the world. Everything doesn't have to be an eternal return of the same as it is in paganism. It is an eternal return of the same. The seasons come and go, the world come and goes, people live and die and they breathe and live and die. But 
There can be an event. That's why our book is called Process and Event. There can be an event, and the event can change history forever. The event can be for good or bad, depending on us humans. It can be Hiroshima. It can also be future nuclear power that might save the world with you know, affordable and, and employative energy forever. You know, it could be any of those things. It depends on where we put our imagination, where we put our efforts, where we work. That's Sorastor's insight. And therefore, he constructs that even an event is possible. And the, the, the fact that the event is possible is what we take with us. The problem with our culture was that we started believing the event so strongly, we forgot about the process. This is the central problem of Western culture. If Eastern culture got too stuck in the process, didn't think the event properly, then the problem with Western culture is that we inherited from the Persians was the belief in the event that the Persians always tied to the process. We ignore the process altogether. And therefore we created a religion that says, if we exploit the world until extinction comes, God will come and save us and give us a new Jerusalem. That's literally what Christianity and Islam have been preaching for thousands of years. And that is, of course, not sustainable at all. We're now discovering that we need both the process, the eternal return of the same circular time, and we need the event, which is linear time. We need to think the world both ways. And this is the beauty then of power sharing. Power sharing reinforces that. It says that there must be split power from day one before you put the button on the AI. It must understand that power must be split. The Chinese don't want that. The Chinese are terrified of it. They go for the Egyptian model that says, no, we're just going to have one pharaoh at the very top and build a huge pyramid, and off we go. And then we know we're going to do with the data. And increasingly now, when data solutions become incredibly complex and incredibly expensive, the Chinese are going to excel at that because it's exactly what they're doing at the moment. They're creating a modern-day Egypt. The question is then, can we, especially America, then create an alternative, which is more like the Persian imperial model? And I think building on the U.S. Constitution is the beginning because the logos, the pathos, and the mythos, the three narratives, are split. The logos is the Congress. The pathos is the president. And, of course, the matriarchal bitch at the opening of the bazaar is the Supreme Court. At least it should be where the mythos is located. So the, 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 you, you have a narratology here that is balanced, dialectical. It never arrives in one truth because there are three different truths that can be spoken at any given time, depending on which of the three positions you take. Now, we know that for a fact. It's a pragmatic solution to the overall problem of power. And the narratives must be there from all three angles. Therefore, we must have a system that implements all three. So my suggestion is that whenever you do with AI, make sure it splits itself dialectically into these three poles before it does anything else. Whereas the Chinese are going for, no, we're going to have one guy at the top, and we're going to marry the AI with Xi Jinping, and off we go, and we have the pharaoh again. Okay, <clears throat> if I may ask a question, because I was uh, listening to this fascinating conversation, and one question arose, and maybe Daniel, you can answer to this, because we were talking about, you know, conscious design of technologies and, you know, outcomes that we didn't expect kind of ways. We were talking about, you know, a third attractor and an ecology, you know, of, of new narratives. But at the same time, um, we know that we are uh, storytelling beings. You know, we can't really live without narratives and myths and stories except we go maybe in meditation and try to um, get rid of that um, but then at the same time we also know that events are way more random than we think you know so we see that you know in the policies let's say how europe dealt with russia and nobody could foresee what is happening right now and so the the, the question really is like if you have uh, our urge to live with narratives and the randomness of future events. So the, the, it's, it's kind of a creator paradox or creator parallax. So how do we create a better future and more functional narratives if we know that the events are way more random than we think and that we can't really foresee what kind of uh, effects our decisions might have? And so that, that question is kind of boggling me. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it's funny because um, a lot of people think about religion in terms of narrative, and there's uh, probably a distinction that Alexander would make between narrative and mythos, but um, roughly I'll just say in terms of narrative. 
and you're talking about the ability to forecast the future or have a certain kind of certainty about the future. Um, and I, I think one of the things, like religion said it's mis mixed bag because there was like good philosophy and then political power plays that got mixed together. Because of course, memes don't spread for no reason. They spread because someone's invested in spreading them and they, so you, you get like, good kind of Gnostic and Nicene and whatever thinking, but then you get the Council of Nicaea making the Bible and the Crusades and they sh change the stuff to be supportive. So like the throw the religions out completely or believe them completely are both silly, right? You've got to kind of look at um, which memes are true, good and beautiful and which ones won war and coordinated people well and the difference between those. And um, <clears throat> But if I think about the meaningful part of religion, a big part of it is how do we actually deal with the radical uncertainty of the world? And knowing that uh, all the choices we make are going to be consequential, not making choices is still making a choice that is consequential. And I'm making every choice under partial information. And there is some stuff that is quite possibly affecting the situation that exists in the unknown unknown set. I don't even know that I'm not factoring it. So how do I make progressively competent, rational decisions while holding the profound amount of uncertainty that we have to have. Um, so there's like a mature relationship to both certainty and uncertainty, right? And being able to hold those together where you, you both get way more epistemic humility and way more epistemic rigor at the same time. Um, okay, so that was just one thing. So I don't think you get anything like perfected prediction and I don't think it's even a good impulse. Like, I don't think it's, it arises from a healthy place in people. This is why so often when I start conversations with friends, like one that happened earlier today about ethics, uh, I end up starting with Heisenberg and Gödel and Tarski and like the upper limits of knowability. Because what it means is I'm not going to get an ethical system that's computable. Um, that as Gödel said, my mathematics can be consistent or complete, but not both, which means bound to incompleteness forever or what Heisenberg showed about measurement, which is deeper than science upon which science rests is I get, um, I, I get indeterminism forever, right? Like a fundamental thing. So that doesn't just mean throw up your hands and believe in whatever God you want, but it does mean <clears throat> that the impulse to certainty is an immature one. And the, the unknowable set is larger. It's a larger infinity than the knowable set is. And so like a healthy relationship with unknowability is part of spiritual maturity or cognitive maturity or emotional maturity or probably all of those. Um, and so then how do we make choices in the presence of that? Um, I don't want my narrative to tell me how it's all going to go with high certainty. I want it to like help me orient to how to make good choices in the presence of the uncertainty as well. I think you guys had a conversation with Mark, uh, the rabbi on here not that long ago, and he said something to me that I think might have been the best formalization of ethics I have, had ever heard. He said that all failures of ethics are failures of intimacy, because if you're in real intimate contact with any reality, whether it's a tree or a forest or a person, the intimacy of the contact, meaning you're, you're not modeling them in some trolley problem way, you're actually really in contact with their sentience informs you everything you need to, to not harm it, with both the motivation and the sentiment, the sensocracy in an embodied sense of it. Um, so the narrative that actually takes us into way more intimacy with the world, um, uh, how we come to progressively better knowing, but we never think that the knowing is more true than it is, which becomes a false idol, right? Um, these are the things I, I want a narrative, a good, a good religion to do. But just very pragmatically, I think there's a lot of things we say we couldn't possibly predict that are really fucking predictable. And we're, we're not trying or we're lying. Um, or we're just applying silly models. There's places where we're applying silly models, like engineers not factoring psychosocial effects if they're not being trained in social sciences. Like, that's just silly. Like, we should do, just do a better job of that. But there are plenty of places where it's like, oh, we had no idea Putin would such and such. Really? like NATO aggresses on his border in every fucking way possible. And he's like, dude, fucking just don't just commit to not take Ukraine into NATO. And they're like, no, we're not going to do it. And they're like, 
how much did we like the Cuban Missile Crisis? The idea of Russian bases that close. It's like, oh, we had no idea who's going to do that. Really? Like, just what would you do in his position? Play the game theory a little bit. So there's a bunch of places where the unpredictability is bullshit um, for things that are actually decently predictable. Um, and then there are places where it's like, okay, there's a radically complex thing. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's where you have to do safe to fail probes. Is there some way to be able to run an experiment here that is not consequential, depending upon how it goes? And if there is no safe to fail probe, then just don't do the thing yet, right? Um, so with a lot of AI and biotech, and I think those are the answers. And then a lot of it just has to do with processes of recursion. So let's say... I want to forecast how my new technology is going to affect people. people. So I think about what are the things this is going to enable that will actually be really desirable. As a result, what behaviors are those people going to do? As a result, how does that affect their minds and psyches? Does it? There's some super simple principles. Like if it's engaging their attention, it should make their attention spend better if it has an effect. Just there's some base reality that it's engaging with. It should enhance the base reality it engages with. If it has choice architectures that are designed to affect the choices people make, i.e. affect their intention, it should support their net intentionality and their sovereignty of locus of control. Like there are some things like that that should be ubiquitous and they're just not, um, that could help to even have sense-making frameworks to think through. Oh, we couldn't have guessed it would have done. Did you even think about what it would do to attention or intention or polarization or anything like that? So we can just do a better job, but there'll be still be some stuff you don't predict, right? So then you run an experiment and then you say, oh, wow, I did this shit we didn't know. So now you turn that into the design process. Then you do a beta release and then you're watching for a bunch of stuff, including some shit that you don't know, right? You're watching for some stuff, but you're also just saying, let's just watch the people using it and the people around them and just see if there's any weird new stuff that happens. Because that's how we deal with the unknown unknowns is that we don't formalize what metrics too closely. We just watch for weird stuff, right? And we didn't expect that there'd be less time at the family dinner table. That's worth noting. So one of the things is if I don't even know what to look for, just do kind of broader spectrum observation. And then say, okay, let's see if we can find out why, do some <clears throat> research on it, and then internalize that into the design and fix it again. But that means that when you observe the thing and then you come up with a new design, whoever comes up with a new design has to have the authority to implement it. Not just, oh, sorry, that goes against our business model and we have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit. So you have to create a business that has a collect or a corporation or whatever it is that has a collective intelligence. Uh, I mean, excuse me, that has a, a type of intelligence that is oriented to be able to forecast as much as it can and to recursively upgrade itself where mistakes were made. I think this ties nicely into our idea of the bazaar. Uh, so it, there has to be some kind of new container here that works and, and it's an alternative to the sort of the Chinese fantasy of the sociocracy. So it's more free and more open and therefore more sustainable, more resilient and will last longer. The argument for the Persian empire is not a moral one. The argument is that the Persian empire lasted over 2,200 years. The Egyptian empire repeatedly imploded and with Ignatan only lasted for six years, it was over and done with. So Stalinism doesn't last. That's the argument against Stalinism here. Uh, resilient systems actually are pragmatic and, and they realize that splitting narratives and splitting power from the very beginning makes the system much more resilient over time and, and therefore it can work in the kind of environments we're moving into right now. And this is something you said about splitting power and that you program that into the AI and this seems extraordinarily problematic because um, checks and balances on power, yes, we like that idea. <laughs> so one, you know as well as I do that AI is not being set up that way and it's moving really fucking fast. So there's a reality to tend to here. The other thing is that <clears throat> making uh, similarly powered AIs divided in an adversarial network is how you make both of them crazy fucking smart, right? And so the reason that AlphaGo was able to defeat Stockfish like it was standing still was because you never programmed a single human game in it. You made two computers play each other a trillion times in three hours. And so what that then does is say, okay, well, this system can check this system and vice versa. The two of those systems now in a, or either of them in combined capacity is so asymmetric to every human system. True, but 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 the, the computers are still only doing the logos. At least I want to believe that. So the pathos and the mythos are two realms left. And if at least the computers are interesting in 
interacted with human beings. They don't go off into outer space and do their own thing as a technological intelligence, which probably should lead them to do it. It's basically say, you can have Mars on your own, right? Please don't kill us on Earth, right? Or something like that. But, it, but if you think about at least at least so far, history has been about human beings and has been a human society we're talking about here. And naturalogically speaking, the computer cannot do the mythos and the computer cannot do the pathos. It can only do the logos, but it does the logos with incredible efficiency and at incredible have you speed. Seen, have you seen Dolly yet? Yeah. The visual GPT-3, visual audio GPT-3? Yeah. Um, so it's early, right? But... Uh, <laughs> Will it be able to generate mythos that are compelling for people at a Turing test passing level? Totally. Will it be able to generate art that is evocative enough that people experience catharsis, i.e. pathos? Sure. So the, is it experiencing pathos or mythos? No. But can it do a thing that evokes it? In fact, maybe even split test for its ability to do that progressively better on an asymptote? Sure. Now, this is really fucked up and interesting, right? Yeah. Because and considering how terrible the latest <laughs> Star Wars script is, if that was written by humans, then humans don't deserve to survive, to be honest about it. You know, we need better artists than that. It's just so fucking crap. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I think, the, I think the, we're, moving to the other, we're moving into the third democracy here. The second one is the Sensocrats or whoever is collaborating with the satellites and the data flows around the world to create the container. So if we isolate the container and think of the container, what we usually call politics is separate from say commerce and business and, 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 and enterprise, which is what we call them. The, so that, that those two are separated. We have the informationalists or the informationism, which is, which is essentially data. And, and that's big tech today. The second one is sensocracy, whatever replaces politics, we know it has to be sensocratic. And if we don't save the planet to begin with, sensocracy will never even happen. So sensocracy has a self-interest in at least saving the planet to begin with. The Chinese have their model. We need to catch up with them quickly and create a different model that I call more Persian. The third one though is the third autocracy is the artistic one. This is the imaginary one. No, this is this, this, the, the real one. It's tied to the pathos. So this is the artistic one because art like sex and violence are actually tied to pathos. So this is intensely human. This is the intense, this is where sexuality, violence is located. This is where we're as far away from the machines themselves as possible. And this is where the symbiotic intelligence comes in. For example, if you're going to write a really fantastic eight hour series that's going to spellbind spell in the world, what you would do today is that you will collaborate with the AI. You will do symbiotic intelligence and practices as an artist. And I think at the end of the day, the machine on its own doing it will be vastly inferior to what a human being can do with a machine. I think for the foreseeable future, we're saved by the fact that symbiotic intelligence will be better than artificial intelligence in, in all of these three narratives that I'm talking about. And if that is the case, which otherwise why we humans be around, you know, but if that is the case, then the, the artistic aspect is the really protopian one. So the protopian, it's not so much that in art, it's not so much that you're productively incrementally improve on something one step at a time, like you do if you're an engineer, but protopianism for an artist is just the, the unbound exploration of, of the darkest shadows and the most fascinating storytelling we could possibly have. And you're telling it to grown-ups. You're not telling it to children in a fundamental sense. Like real art is challenging you. It's challenging you in a transformative way. And it has to be the third aspect of an autocracy. And we will give away the third power to the people who with their machines are capable of doing that. This is where art is heading. And I think, again, our term that you and I developed, symbiotic intelligence, fits better here than artificial intelligence when it comes to doing these things. I've wrote pop songs for 25 years, and I've heard machines writing pop songs. And yes, they sound generic and professional, but they sound like German pop songs. Like they say, like, I just copy last week's number one record, and I make it a new record. Now we can hear what you copied. It's just too similar to what we heard. It's eerily boring, right? And so far, at least, the machines have not been able to come up with anything else because machines always work in the past. The, the, the curse of logos is that logos can only work with data that already exists. It can only write things that are similar to what we already have. But the idea to imagine a future that's radically different from anything we've ever seen is still a very, very human capacity. Funny because one of the reasons <clears throat> that GPT-3 is passing the Turing test now is because for many audiences, and if you have GPT-3 created text in areas of subject matter expertise and subject matter experts are looking at it, they know it doesn't pass the Turing test. But for general chatbot functions, it does. 
But it's not because the AI has gotten that good. It's because most people's ability to be able to vet theory of mind or have deep, deep conversation has gotten so bad that there's like this, like, it's kind of funny, but it's like reclaim the quality of the Turing test by increasing human intelligence to be deserving of the term of general intelligence that we can make the test a little harder. Um, the reason I bring it up is because, so let's say we have a symbiotic intelligence where we have a, a human using a transformer AI to generate stuff and people like it. Well, in the classic adversarial network type style, I could then train another AI on the output of that symbiotic intelligence and whatever the metric of win is, um, pop chart hits or whatever that is going to be judged by the demand consumption of by other humans, I just say beat it. And of course, now what it's trained to do is be able to identify the things that do more of that. And so of course it will, like it'll, it'll be able to beat that. If we can define it in any narrow metrics, because it's the same as beating us at StarCraft or chess or Go, as soon as it can define it as a finite game. <clears throat> I don't think it can win at the, an infinite game, but I also don't think most humans are oriented to infinite games right now, nor are economic systems or anything else. And so it's like, I think the symbiotic intelligence would produce more meaningful things if the depth of what it means to be human and the depth of the experience, the depth of the pathos and the mythos that are not the logos is fully brought to both the creation of it and fully brought to the appreciation of it by others, which is now why this work in, in culture and narrative is so important because anything less than that, if it's if it's consumers who want one marshmallow hypernormal stimuli and producers who want to supply that, no, the AI will be the symbiotic intelligence. Yeah, and this is this goes for popular culture, certainly. And we're very dark in digital libido. So it's not right that the vast majority of people will be sedated by popular culture that's probably manufactured by machines because it's more efficient to do it that way. But there'll be something eerie about it. The thing is that you might be fooled once, but you're not fooled several times over until you discover this eerie feeling that this is increasingly predictable and it's increasingly flattering, like the culture is flattering. And this is the problem of popular culture. It might work for kids' stories. It might work for Disney, right? But that's not art at all. And I think this is why we so strongly philosophically defend the concept of art. And we put, uh, put it in the pathical narrative. The mythical narrative, yes, can be mass produced. It can be manufactured by technological intelligence. It's just if you put the button on the AI and it produces Disney culture, that's exactly the new Star Wars series. That's why it's crap because the script is so bad, it's so predictably bad, right? Because it just tries to flatter you, tries to flatter, it doesn't, it doesn't challenge you, it's not gonna transform you at all. Real art therefore has to be located next to sex and violence. And we call the tantric realm in the really grown up adult realm. It challenges you fiercely, otherwise it isn't art at all. And it challenges you to transform you. The truly artistic experience is not just to kill time, that's what Silicon Valley and Hollywood are trying to do. They just try to kill time. No, real art is that you go through a transformative experience, like a spiritual experience, that transforms you. You're a totally different person when you come out of the experience compared to who you were before. In either direction, it doesn't matter. You're changed. You have gone through an event. Your life is no longer the repetition of the same. I don't see any machine being able to do anything remotely like that yet. And that's why art has to get out of popular culture, return to its own realm and go spiritual. And that's why we put art in the pathical narrative. That's what's important in narratology. Mythical narrative can be mass produced. Yes, that's popular culture. But pathical narrative is an entirely different thing. And I would know because I was in the mythical narrative production when I was a pop song writer and pop song producer. I never tried to do jazz or opera. I went to the opera and I enjoyed jazz because I didn't do it. I didn't do anything pathical at all. I did mythical things. But to then go into the pathical narrative where I try to be as a philosopher is fiendishly more challenging, but it's absolutely required. And this is probably of all the three narratives, the hardest one to nail. Because at the end of the day, we now live in a world where death is the absolute. Uh, I, I am adamant, I'm, I'm with a lot of thinkers today to say that the problem with the West is that we banned everything that was uh, uh, out of our comfort zone, and we basically called it sin. And at least in the East, they realized that no, sin is not going to disappear. So instead of creating pressure cookers that blow over all the time and cause huge warfare and misery, instead, it's better to have it around, but to have it around inside a container. And only those who can handle it can go there and handle that container. They're the ones who can have access to it. That's the concept of Tantra. This is the difference in Sutra. Sutra is the message, the narrative that makes people love their children so they want to survive. 
That is the ultimate truth of sutra. Sutra has a direction. It must be exactly that. The opposite of the sutra is the tantra. It's like, okay, we don't know where this is going. Therefore, we're containing it. We're keeping it in some kind of a laboratory. And it can only be accessed by people who can really go through it. And that's where sex and art and violence must be located. But we must realize that these are factors of human life. And that's what we're working with as philosophers at the moment. So I think it's important here to make that distinction. I don't see any machine even being remotely close to creating a credible, pathical narrative in the foreseeable future. It's funny that you say that uh, the elites now believe in death because um, in so many important ways, I don't see that. Like the uh, extreme life extension movement, radical life extension movement uh, for radical biological extension is totally a holy grail pursuit. And then the biggest one, of course, uh, and, and the brain computer interface um, pursued all the way up to the full digital consciousness singulatarian. We can all be uh, AI gods in a universe that we can fork infinitely. Rem have, remember how forever. I told you, Daniel, that engineers don't know what they're doing because the engineers haven't talked to the priests. This is the perfect example to give exactly that. They're going to create things that are not at all what they thought they're going to create. But so and, and, what, and whatever, they're all going to be disappointed when they die and finally learn to die with some fucking grace. And I think, but I think the death is the absolute has arrived. It has existed all along. Buddhists, Thorasters, and Taoists always knew they would die when they die. And the question is, what transcends you? They always have that question. That question has been around for thousands of years. We just need to get rid of these childish religions that promise us the afterlife or the reincarnation because it was too hard to tell children that their parents had died. Right? It, it's just, it's just death as the absolute has arrived. I think it's the dominant story today. And I think these people who try to escape try to escape precisely because they find it hard to die. It's funny. One of the things I really like about the invisible afterlife, um, I like the reincarnation version better than the heaven and hell version, but I like that you can get narcissistic and even sadistic people to do the right things for the wrong reasons. Um, meaning if I don't want to reincarnate badly, and I can't hide the karma from God or from uh, the universal accounting system, then even though if I could hide it from the humans, I'd fuck everybody over and get ahead. And if death was the end, that'd be fine. The fact that I can't hide it from the day of judgment or whatever it is means now I have to do the right thing for my own prevention of suffering. Uh, I think that was actually brilliant. And I think there were places where that, obviously it didn't work all that well in many places, but there were places where it did. Um, how you create a system where even if someone, uh, if someone's focus of self is too personal, right? Too much narcissistic trait, not enough um, uh, empathy, et cetera, they still are oriented to a system of ethics. I think that's one of the things the system has to do as a fail safe while it works to condition people who all have authentic intimacy where emergent ethics can arise. Um, I know it is time for us to wrap up and it's late. One thing I was going to say we should do next time that would be fun. We opened a lot more threads than we closed, but that's good. You started talking about um, uh, what AI won't get and will get in the future and what the three different types of uh, netocracies will be. And I, I think if we were to just kind of give a vision, like what is a positive vision for the not too distant future? Like you know, 50 years out or so that we can see that involves uh, getting mythos, pathos, logos, all meaningfully better, right? That my terms might be getting some of the critical things that have to happen in infrastructure and social structure and superstructure, whatever. Um, what is a vision that could happen? That would be a fun, that'd be a fun place to go. I totally agree. Uh, so I just want to add that we also need a new sutra. Uh, a new story about how we're going to love our children. Therefore, we want our children to survive it. We need a new one. So we can't go back to the old ones. And, and when it comes to the belief in the afterlife, that also ruined ancient Egypt. That's why ever since then, we sort of suspected that we will not live after we're dead. So <laughs> the, the afterlife was a very, very destructive thought in that sense. We, when it was taken all the way through, the, the ancient Egyptians, at least in the first kingdom, seriously <laughs> believed that life after death was more important than life right here and now. Ever since then, well, at least we've doubted it. 
So uh, I think those, those I, I think once uh, the gene is out of the bottle historically in the sense that a certain tantra has now leaked into the sutra and we can no longer pretend it's not there. That's what I mean. We, we cannot construct a system where we believe in the afterlife, we believe in reincarnation any longer. We cannot even believe that we're going to conquer outer space and live on other planets because we're way too late to that race. AI will certainly beat us to it. So AI will take bacteria away and go to other planets and we won't even be part of the game. That's more likely. So we, we can look into that. We can look into what could possibly be the new sutra be what could be the new story we could actually tell each other and agree on and then at least the tantra itself we know it's around but it's hidden in containers for the people who can actually absorb it and understand it and thankfully because it's tantra is so tied to complexity that we can only specialize on certain complexities like you and i honorably do it's just that we're supposed to be generalists when nobody can be a generalist any longer that's impossible we can only understand that that's impossible and therefore we're more hegelian in the sense that our absolute knowing is not that we know everything it's that we know the limits of our own knowledge and we thrive within that limit and that's exactly what we're promoting very pragmatic ideas constantly we will learn from history like and it's moving quicker than ever it's more important than ever to be pragmatic about history and to make due process before we make decisions and start building things that's where you are absolutely adamant anything else is completely irresponsible from now on historically speaking so i, I would love we to agree. dig in more, we agree dig more into that yes absolutely all right this is fun Alexander, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time. I think it's very late at your end, Daniel. What is it, two o'clock in the morning already? Yes. Thank you again. Uh, uh, fascinating conversation. I would love to do a second part where we uh, have a look at the future. In 50 years, it sounds super interesting. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. Um, thank you, Tom, for making the space and having us here, and, uh, and Alex for uh, having the dialogue. I, it's funny because you and I think about things that are so related and I think both try to um, bring deep frameworks and they're such different frameworks. It was like such different schools of study that um, uh, I really enjoy it because I get different insights and learn every time we talk. Thank you so much. I'm on, I'm over here in Europe and we have Hegel and Nietzsche. You have the fantastic American pragmatists and our shared friends, Lehman, Pascal and Sachs Stein are big fans of Peirce and James and these guys. That is the other tradition that I really, really, really think is fantastic. And for anybody's interest in philosophy, you need to do your Hegel and your Nietzsche and certainly your Freud, but you certainly need to do the American pragmatist. Too. That's the tradition you come from. And, and I, I hear it in the way you speak and the way you address issues that there's so much of American pragmatism coming through to you. And I should say this last thing. I'm off to the borderland next week, which is Northern Europe's burning man. So, of course, another thing that Dan and I have in common with both good old burners. <laughs> well, have a blast there. I have some friends that are going to be going there and uh, maybe I'll connect you all and you can meet up there. Exactly. Speaking, speaking of the pathical narrative, participatory culture is where it's at.